Welcome. CloudU is a vendor neutral education and training program focusing on some of the most important topics in technology today. We hope you find it a great resource where you can go read a paper on a certain topic or earn the CloudU certificate. Today we've got a really exciting topic to talk about. Our own Robert Scoble is going to be interviewing Eric Rees, author of the New York Times bestselling The Lean Startup, and John N. Gates, Raxis's own CTO, about the impact of cloud computing on the startup environment. We really hope you enjoy the program. Hello, welcome to Cloud University. I'm Robert Scoble and I work for Rackspace. That's probably going to be the last time you hear about Rackspace on this show because we have a really spectacular uh, set of guests for you. First of all, we have John Ed Gates, the CTO of Rackspace, so we can get geeky. Good morning, Robert. <laughs> and we have Eric Reese here uh, who has started a religion in the San Francisco and the tech world, which we'll get to in a second. This is a, a series of firsts for us at Rackspace. First of all, this is the first session in our new office in San Francisco and we're kicking off a, a, a grand opening day today which we'll go into a little bit later. Um, this is our first San Francisco speaker series so we're going to do regular speaker, speaker series here in this room with technical experts, marketing people, we have the GoPro video team coming later this afternoon to talk a little bit about what they're doing um, and on and on and we, we'll talk more about that on our blogs and Google Plus and Twitter and Facebook, so just keep in touch with, with us there. This webinar is part of the CloudU program. It's a, a vendor neutral. We try not to push Rackspace and try to really take a, a holistic view at, at, of the industry and not just push our own point of view. You can learn more at uh, RackspaceCloudUniversity.com. There's also a LinkedIn group, which uh, we probably won't watch while we're doing this, but uh, uh, after this we'll uh, be interacting with people there and it's quite active. And uh, that kicks it off. So welcome, Eric. Thank hey. you for coming. Thanks for having me. And thanks, uh, thanks John, all for right. coming all the way from Texas. Yeah. And we're here in our new office. Yeah, I only had to come two blocks. I guess I got the easier end of the deal. So I loved your book. And I, 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 I've, I've interviewed you a few times before. And, and you've really started a religion. I, I hear <laughs> about, uh, you know, and I, I interview a lot of entrepreneurs. And I go and visit their companies. I was at Color yesterday. and. I was at Flipboard the day before, and I keep hearing things like minimal viable <laughs> product and uh, you know the kinds of approaches that you take to building a company. It's a, almost a scientific approach, right? So I, yeah. I wanted to try something. Let, let's the three of us. Let's start a, a company, right? Let's build an iPhone app, maybe a bragging app. And, and and a lot of kids, a lot of people around the world are having that same kind of conversation right now. You know, somebody could be saying, well, I, I can disrupt pizza delivery, or I want to be the next Twitter, or I want to, you know, do something with a, an iPhone and TV, or, and a lot of people are having that conversation. What's next? What, what should their, once they've decided to do a company with their friend or, or a, 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 you know, a, a geek, what's, what should be their next step? Well, in the movies, that's actually the really interesting part. You just have a really good idea, come up with a great product, find yourself in the right place at the right time. That's kind of act one. Then we go right into act two, the photo montage. It's over like two minutes, you know, no dialogue, just some scenes of us pounding on keyboards, shaking some hands. Boom, move right into the interesting part, act three, being on the cover of magazines. And in the movies, that's all you have to do. Come up with a good idea, work hard, make a lot of money. But actually, uh, all the decisions of import that actually determine the success of startups happen in act two. They don't make it into the movies because they're too boring. It's all about trying to figure out, okay, well, we're going to build this app. Well, what features does it absolutely need to have? What customers do we want to listen to and who do we want to ignore? And then once we start building it, how do we know if we're on the right track, we should persevere or pivot to something different? Those are the really hard, excruciating, and let's face it, boring decisions we've got to make. So Lean Startup is all about making those decisions, as you said, more scientific. And in this case, you know, these kinds of apps generally have a very clear business model. It's you want to build up a large base of customers who trade you their attention and time in exchange for the product that you give them effectively for free. But it's not really free. You're collecting this huge asset of all this customer attention, which you intend at some point down the road to resell to some third-party advertisers. So you have this ecosystem. They trade you their time and or attention. Or to other companies. I was talking to Dennis Crowley, who started Foursquare Absolutely. this morning, and he's talking about uh, uh, he built a platform, a database of all these locations. Mm -hmm. and 
now other companies like Instagram or Path are using his database in their own apps, right? Yeah. And they're going to pay for that. Exactly so. right. So you have to have some kind of theory about how this is all going to fit together, how the pieces are going to add up. And then what you got to do is identify which of those things, they're really assumptions. There's no facts yet. This is just a theory. Which of those assumptions are the riskiest, the ones that you're most worried about? And in an app, you know, like we're talking about, almost always the issue, the primary issue is can you get people to behave in the way your beautiful business plan says they're supposed to behave? Well, you, can you get them to do the check-in behavior, the rating behavior, the logging in? Can you get them addicted to use the product every day? And if that's true, then our perspective is as quickly as possible, at the first earliest opportunity, let's go test that assumption to find out if it's true. Will people, in fact, behave that way? So when we talk about minimum viable product, or MVP, um, what we're talking about is what is the smallest amount of work we absolutely have to do to conduct a scientific experiment that will tell us whether this assumption is a correct assumption or a false one. It's actually a very simple empirical question. Will people do the behavior or won't they? You told me uh, when we talked before that this came out of pain, right? Yeah. <laughs> because you developed a product for six months or something, it's some uh -huh. number of months, worked on it really hard, thought you had a great idea, and then you put up a link on a web page that said download it now, yep. and nobody clicked on the link to download it. Yeah, uh, it was excruciatingly painful because we thought, you know, this was five, more than five years ago now, so, so building your whole product in only six months was considered very fast. Now, you spend six months, you're hopeless, but in those days, that was considered very fast. And we thought, okay, get it out there, and I was the CTO of this company, so, you know, I was, my reputation's on the, on the line for the quality of this software, and I was worried that we would put it out there and then people would download it, it would crash their computer, and I could see in my mind's eye this like newspaper article, you know, idiots at IMV, that's the name of the company, idiots, you know, ship low quality software, and there's my mugshot, you know, and my career is like going down in flames. But actually, when we did ship it, as you said, I was actually relieved that nobody found out how bad it was because nobody would download it. Yeah. I was like, that was good news at first, like, well, at least, and I was like, wait, hold on, this is actually really depressing. Why did I just spend the last six months of my life building this thing that nobody even wants to download? Yeah. And so, the problem was that I had been trained as an engineer to look at a specification document and say, what is the fastest way to achieve the specification? And that's how I got into my very fast six months minimum time. But if, if I reconceive that as, wait a minute, that's not my goal. My goal is not to achieve the specification. Yeah. My goal is to learn whether this experiment will work or not. So what's the fastest way I could get that learning unlocks a whole new set of questions, which is, wait a minute, if all I'm trying to figure out if people will download this thing or not, what, ma what does it matter what's on page two and beyond if I can't even get people past page one? Do I even need a page two or can I just have a 404 there that's like, sorry, there's no product here, too bad? Well, if they won't click the button, they won't download the product, that literally means our value proposition is so bad, we can't get them to click this giant download button. Yeah. So our entire business, we can narrow down to this one very simple leap of faith uh, question, which is, will people click this frickin' button? Yeah. And if the answer is no, it really doesn't matter if it crashes their computer or it's beautiful design or none of that other stuff. So, you know, what we want to do is work backwards from what are we trying to learn to what's the smallest amount of work we have to do to get that learning right now. The, the new way now, if we're building an iPhone app, uh, Instagram did this to me. They just loaded their app on my iPhone. <laughs> they <laughs> stole my iPhone because I was walking yeah, through uh -huh. uh, Dog Patch Labs. There was two kids sitting at a table and go, we, we want to put something on your iPhone and see if you use it. <laughs> <laughs> And they loaded it up, and I was like, oh, that's really nice. <laughs> and then I started taking pictures yeah. with it. And so they instantly saw, oh, there is a usage pattern, right? There, there it is. And, and I hear a lot of people say, well, um, on iPhone or these mobile platforms where there's an app store and all this distribution challenges, you can't be lean because you have to do the big launch. But even on the iPhone, you can do ad hoc distribution, just like you said. I think you have a maximum limit of 100 people. And people are like, oh, 100 is not enough. But I don't know. If our goal is to learn, if 100 people in a row hate your product, What's the learning value of the 101st person? Nothing. The 1,000th first person, the millionth person. Uh, if, if you have the wrong product, why should you be so proud of having these gigantic numbers of people who try it and churn out? So if you can prove that the model works in micro scale, that's really what we're doing here. To say, you know, let's, let's get 10 people to love our app, and then, you know, and then we'll move up. And then we'll kind of graduate to 20 and 50 and 100, and look, eventually 100 million. But before you get to 100 million, you've got to get to 100. So if we're the two guys or three guys that is sitting at Dogpatch Labs or, you know, uh, Y Combinator or any of these new uh, uh, incubators, what, what do we do to get this thing going? And what do we do technically? I, this afternoon we have uh, New Relic coming, uh -huh. which will let you monitor your system. 
we'll get into that. But wh what's the next step? Like, how do we get? The, how do we start building our company and get to that point where I can stick it on, you know, Rocky's iPhone and see if he really yeah. likes it or not? I mean, the most important thing is to really get serious about speed. So there's a video on my blog. You can check it out for something. This is a very, uh, you know, may seem like a very different example. It's a company called Nordstrom, the clothing retailer. Okay, in the Fortune 500, huge company. They have something called the Nordstrom Innovation Lab, which is a lean startup group inside of Nordstrom. And the reason I use this as an example is because it's Nordstrom, they followed them around with cameras for a week to see what they do, and they made a video about it. So you can actually see what they do. And you can watch them uh, go into a store. They physically set up, you know, they call it a flash build. So they got their computers and the developers, everything in a store. They're in trying to build an app to help Nordstrom sell sunglasses better. And they show up on Monday with no idea what they're going to build. And by Friday, they have a fully functioning app deployed. So already, you're thinking about the time scale of a week. What can you get done in a week? And what's amazing is you can watch them on the video. They are in real time. They got two iPads, one that they have in development, one that the salespeople are using with customers. And every time there's a new build, they put it on the iPad and swap the iPads. That's it. So as fast as the software can be written, it is immediately in customers' hands to find out what works and what doesn't work. And you know there are all kinds of unique challenges with sunglasses, like that they're polarized, and so is the iPad screen. So if you hold it in the wrong rotation, all you see is black. And all kinds of little things that you could sit at the whiteboard and try to anticipate all those problems, you know, forever. Or in five minutes, you can find out what the real problems actually are. And if you think about it from a lean manufacturing point of view, because that's where lean startup comes from, where lean lean manufacturing was all about reducing excess inventory. You know, every car it's like half built sitting in your warehouse that customers aren't buying from you is a form of waste. Well, in uh, software development, especially in a startup, every piece of code that you write that is not currently being tested by actual customers is a form of inventory. And if you decide to release in a month, or God forbid, six months, then you've got all this excess work in progress inventory that's all a gigantic form of or waste. Or worse, if you work at Microsoft and you ship every three years, you know, like SharePoint does, or Office, or uh, Windows You know, does. when you have the legacy of a culture where they put the year the product came out in the name of the product, <laughs> like Windows 95, Office 2000, that tells you something really serious about the cycle time that they uh, think about. Where, where, did, where did you learn about lean manufacturing? Because I, I learned about it by going around with uh, NetOptics, who builds all of mm -hmm. their uh, server devices he here in, in San Francisco, in the San Francisco area. Yeah. And one worker ha can build 300 different products, all with one workstation, all mm -hmm. with uh, every, every part is, is by their hand. So they can build one part at a time. Where, where did you learn about this, and, and how does that apply to software? I'll tell you a, a, a dirty little secret is that I actually know nothing about manufacturing. <laughs> I've never set foot in a manufacturing plant, and building physical things scares the bejeebus out of me. I'm really a software person. Everything I know about manufacturing, I learned from reading books about it. So actually, whenever there's a manufacturing person in the room, I'm always a little nervous. But the reason those ideas were compelling to me is that I was actually doing a lot of this stuff as a manager, especially at my last company, InView. Um, where I was in charge of the technology team. And so I was trying to put together a system that made sense to me. And it worked really well. We practiced, for example, continuous deployment, which is that process of putting code into production as, you know, in single piece flow as fast as it's written 50 times a day on average. Yeah. And I could see that that worked. I had an intuitive sense that it worked, but I could never explain it to anybody. So every new employee we would hire, especially if they worked, you know, for 10 years in the industry, on day one, we were like, today you were going to ship something to production on your first day. And they'd be like, no, 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 that's, you know, listen, kid, that's not, how it's, that, that's not how it's done. And they'd be scared, like, what if I take the site down? And I'd be like, listen, if it's so easy to take the site down that you can do it on your first day, then shame on us for making it so easy. And I had to go this process of having this huge argument. Sometimes it would last for months with these new employees who would be like, this doesn't make sense. This can't possibly work. And I'm like, look with your own eyes. It is working. Yeah. And then when I started to be asked to advise other companies, you know, Silicon Valley is a very small club. People started to ask me to be an advisor. I'd come in and I'd be like, hey, here's a story of something we did at InView. It worked for us. Maybe it would work for you. And they'd be like, no, that would never work. I'm like, uh, it's not a theory. I'm telling you the truth about what happened to me. I was there. I saw it. And people didn't believe me. They thought I was lying to them. They're like, that's crazy. And so I was you really can't looking. Software every 20 minutes? It can't be done. It cannot be done. And for every size X that InView was, people always told us it'll work at size X, but couldn't possibly work at size 2X. We were five people. If you're like, sure, it'll work for five people, but never work for 10, never work for 20, never work for 40. Now we're 120 people. You know, and people are like, well, what work when you get to 240? Like, I don't, I don't think that's true. Uh, and 
the problem is we have the wrong paradigm for thinking about productivity and efficiency in uh, software development and in startups in particular. And so I was really hungry for new ideas to try to just find a theoretical framework for explaining to people what the heck is going on here. Yeah. And once I learned about Lean, their big question in Lean Manufacturing was really, how do you tell the difference between what creates value and what's wasteful? I mean, that is the, the big, big question you learn to see everything in your production process through the eyes of your customer. Does your customer care how much inventory you carry? No, they only care if you have a high quality product that works for them. As startups though, we can't use that standard because we don't know who our customer is yet. We have nothing more than a theory, a hypothesis about the customer. Well, that's a really different situation. So if you reconceive a startup as an experiment where the unit of progress, the way you know you're creating value is validated learning, scientific learning about how to build a sustainable business, well then all the tools in the lean, startup, in the lean manufacturing toolkit become available because now we have a standard. Here's what's valuable, learning about what customers want, everything else is waste, even if it seems like a really good idea. So I think a lot of the startups that you meet with that are using minimum viable product as an excuse to you, because they're like, oh, no, it's, I know what the thing sucks, it doesn't do anything, but it's just an MVP, really are completely missing the point. They want you to help them get big fast. Yeah. But it's like, no, 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 MVP is not an excuse you use with Scoble. MVP is a standard you use internally way before you've launched to someone in the press to say, hey, do we actually know what the hell we're talking about? And if the answer is no, stop. Don't launch, don't get yeah. big. Stop and figure it out, pivot, make it work. Yeah. You know, so by the time you're pitching somebody, it actually works. No, it, and that, that's true, because I'm going to try and load your software up, and if it doesn't work. Uh, but it, but uh, the MVP thing, and I'll try to get John in, in this conversation. Yeah, I want to ask something in just a second here, too. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, let's come back to the MVP, because um, um, when, when companies pitch me products, often it works. It, it, you know, it does what they say it does, but it's not satisfying because they're really planning on another business model. Right. And they haven't shown me that yet. You know, in other words, like uh, these bragging apps that we were yeah. talking about. Well, a, a lot of them, like Oink or uh, Stamped, it's about collecting a lot of cool data. Well, their real business model is they're going to sell that data or they're going to uh, bring out a new iPad app that's going to show you all the cool things you did in your life right. or show you a timeline or something. And that's the real product. That's what we're putting this data in for. There's yeah. some other use for it, like food spotting. I, the reason I'm taking pictures of food <laughs> isn't just to brag to my friends that I had a cool meal. It's so other people who are looking for food can look at this app and, and find food. That's the real business model, right? Yeah. And, and a lot of these apps come out and they aren't finished. They, they, haven't, got, they haven't shown me the other part of it. Yeah, and I want to be super clear. The mistake is not launching in the sense of what we call the product launch, that is having customers use the app. That's something that should happen as soon as possible. You know, I think Reid Hoffman gets the credit for having said, if you're not embarrassed by version one of your product, you've waited too long. Like, that's all good. That's finding out what's really true from a small number of actual customers in the real world, very important. But the marketing launch, when you go around telling people how great you are and try to really juice your numbers up and get everybody to write about you and you know, get Scoble to adopt your app and tell everyone it's the best thing since sliced bread, you want to do that as late as possible when you actually know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. And the only way to get from here to there is to be in a process of constant iteration to discover what works. I certainly would not accept any phone calls from journalists, members of the press about your app until you've actually demonstrated real traction in every element of your business model so that you know what works. Now Flipboard would disagree. A, a lot of people would disagree. Yeah, but Flipboard, they showed me their app, but they listened and they didn't show it for uh, public consumption. They right. just said, we want you to see something and see how you react to it. Uh -huh. And I, I do that once in a while. I'll, I'll agree to embargoes that are three months. I saw Siri six months before it shipped, mm -hmm. right? Because they wanted just to see, is this going to interest you? Is, is, does it grab your, your attention? So but here's my question. I, uh, you know, Scoble loves talking about real startups, but you know, Rackspace is a four almost 4,000 employee company who st sort of still thinks it's a startup. And uh, does this work in the context of bigger companies? Is there a way to embrace this kind of idea within a, a company our size? Not only is it possible, I think it's imperative. If you look at the toolkit of general management, you know, what, the, the rules that we learned over the course of the past century for how do you manage large companies, they have at their heart uh, the tools of planning and forecasting. Right? A manager who should be promoted is someone who's ahead of plan. Stock price goes up if you beat the expectations. So it's all about forecasting. 
Accurate forecasting requires a long and stable operating history from which to make the forecast. Otherwise, it won't be accurate. And who feels like the world is getting more and more stable every day? You know, no, nobody feels that way. Things are going crazy as cycle times collapse, as way more startups enter the market. It's just getting more difficult. So more and more of our work, if you think about work as a giant portfolio, is being moved out of the low risk, you know, relatively steady reward zone of you know, predictability and stability into this zone of instability. And the case I try to make in the book is that what we need as a society is a new management toolkit. I call it entrepreneurial management because entrepreneurship is the management discipline that deals with high uncertainty situations. Every app, every startup in San Francisco, when you're trying to start something new, you don't have no idea if it's going to work. That is the highest level of uncertainty possible. So I think it is not only possible but imperative for large companies to master that kind of management. Not for their entire company. You know, there's still an established business that needs to be run by the numbers. But for the part of the business that faces high uncertainty, where there's new product introduction, where you want to do something revolutionary or disruptive, you have to be able to create and foster internal startups and then figure out how do we hold them accountable? How do we know if they're making progress? And by the way, those are the exact same challenges we face in the proverbial garage. How do you know if you're making progress? Right. How can VCs, your spouse, how can they hold you accountable? How can we hold ourselves accountable? Mm -hmm. We've, to know we've done that in Rackspace. I mean, it sort of sounds very familiar because a lot of the, the ways that That's we great. built new products and new businesses at Rackspace is by sort of splitting off a group of people, giving them their own space mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. their own you know, office space make them feel like a real startup, give them the folding tables and the, yeah. you know, the ping pong table and the couches and you know, make it feel like a startup and give them a little bit of uh, runway to go, go, go mm -hmm. figure it out and go test it and go do things. And in fact, one of the ways we did it is under a different banner in terms of the company name. We actually started our cloud business years ago under the name Moso. It was right. a different pr really uh, product, different group, people that had their own identity. And it helped, I think, with uh, the, the trial and error that goes on with figuring out what the mm -hmm. product is mm -hmm. and how it works. Most yeah. big companies screw that up because they, they think of the, the corporate brand, no matter how good the corporate brand is, it has a kind of halo effect that's really helpful for incremental, you know, steady new product launches. Right. It's totally destructive to disruptive launches because yeah. you don't have the freedom to fail if you're going to ruin the corporate brand. That's right. So doing it, uh, you know, on a separate brand is uh, that's super smart. The other thing I think is really key is how do you have those teams show you progress? Too often, especially in Silicon Valley, we are addicted to what I call the vanity metrics. Yep. The big numbers you want to put in your press release to make your competitors feel bad. It's all about how many customers do you have, how much profit do you have. It's all ROI based. Right. Yeah. But really disruptive how things start. Yeah, how many have. downloads? Oh my God, who cares? Really, really disruptive apps always start as a toy, right? So they, right. they work super well for a tiny, tiny set of early adopters. Well, if Apple you're looking at the that way. Apple computer, right? The Apple One, how many Apple Ones are there in the whole world? I think less than 200. So, you know, before you get to be the Steve Jobs who's up on stage launching the iPad, you got to be the Steve Jobs who has the courage to sell 200 people on Apple One. And in those, at that stage, that critical stage, a successful startup and a total fail startup look the same from the vanity metrics. They will both have a pathetically small number of customers. Mm -hmm. But if you're a Twitter or a Facebook, you know, even when you have only a few hundred customers, the per customer data will be there to say customers love this product, they are addicted to it, yeah. and there's signs of progress. So we have to actually change our whole mindset about how we measure progress and hold teams accountable. It's, it's actually an accounting revolution that's needed, which I know sounds really boring. Wow. But hey, that's okay, we got to do what we got to do. I'm getting a few questions that are a, a little bit on building the business. In, in other words, one question was, well, should I move to Silicon Valley, right? Uh, can I build a, a business in uh -huh. the UK? I know you can, because Skype did it, and other companies oh, have yeah. done it. Oh, yeah, we uh, did it. Groupon, <laughs> you, you guys <laughs> This did is it our first Texas. office in Silicon Valley, or if you want to consider yeah. San Francisco Bay Area. And we, we did it in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, it, it is certainly possible. Yeah. And then the, another question that came in uh, from Matthew um, is uh, about funding. You know, he's, he's working a day job right now, and he has this dream of starting a company. And he says, how, how do I pers pursue my startup dream while still being able to pay for his rent and car insurance mm -hmm. and stuff like that? First of all, let's just deal with the Silicon Valley thing first, because I don't want to mince words. I love being in Silicon Valley. I live two blocks from here. 
I think this really is the world headquarters for innovation, and I, you know, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. So I'd be lying if I said I didn't think there are special advantages to being in Silicon Valley. But there are also special disadvantages to being in Silicon Valley because we are totally fad oriented, and we got every time somebody's successful, we tend to fund like 500 clone startups, and you know, I, I don't even know you probably know better than I what the current hot thing is for the next two weeks. You know, we'll fund 100 yeah. of these things, yeah, <laughs> right? Like a stall path clones. Good job, guys. Uh, and, and that's you know that's a real liability. So if you know sometimes until next week, yeah, until There's next week, there will be something else. I mean, I <laughs> I just saw Wealthfront did their launch today, so probably finance clones next week. Who, you know, who knows? Uh, that's just the way we are here, and that's that can be a liability. If you have something that's kind of counter trend, it could be hard to get oxygen here, and it can be a big advantage to being somewhere else. So I don't think you have to be in Silicon Valley, and you don't have to do the conventional model. You can find your own way to make it work. That really is a big message of this methodology, is that if you follow the right process, if you are disciplined about using your resources well, you can make it work with no money, with a lot of money, with VCs, without VCs, bootstrapping, or you know, even as a social enterprise. There's a lot of different models that can work. And so instead of trying to be like, how do I be more like such and such other famous person, try to figure out how do I make who I am work and figure out if what I think is in fact true. Yeah. And then, you know, if you're in a day job, that's not necessarily good or bad. I know people who have quit their job and kind of gone all in on their startup, and that's been a huge important thing to keep them focused. And I know people who did that and the pressure was too high and it just it caused them too much stress and it caused the thing to blow up prematurely. So sometimes it makes sense to quit your job, sometimes not. It really depends on who are you, how disciplined do you work, what are your actual needs, you know, in terms of your personal life, what will allow you to really focus on making a great product. And if you look at the famous entrepreneurs, you'll see their backgrounds all over the map because the kind of where you live and who you are, you know, what kind of personality you have, all that stuff is basically irrelevant, I think. Yeah. I, I certainly see that building a company is changing. You know, in the Apple era, when you were, you know, you know when I was a kid growing up in Silicon Valley, it was very expensive to build a company. Oh, yeah. Because you had to build stuff, right? Uh, yeah. I, even a server, if, even a, in the early days of the web, you had to, you know, hire data rack space and, and build a data center and, yeah. and, and buy a lot yeah, of servers. Yeah, it's expensive. It was really expensive back then. Now it's, you can buy servers cheaper than back then, but now you can slide your credit card in and buy some cloud computing resources, right? I do it right from my iPad. I can start up a new server and try a little thing out and see if it works and put it up on Google Plus or Twitter or Facebook and, totally. and, and use your methodology to build a company, right? Yeah, what's amazing about it is not just how cheap it is, but how fast it is. So the other day, I was waiting for a concert to start. We had about half an hour. I was hanging out with one of the founders of Twilio, the phone uh, cloud service, and we actually were like, oh, that's, that's a cool idea for an app. We had nothing to do. We had half an hour. We built the app. We launched it that, that day, and it turned out nobody used it. So we just really figured out, hey, this is a bad idea. No, no need to waste any more of my time on it. Okay, half an hour of my life that I was going to spend waiting for a concert to start anyway, no big deal. It was pretty amazing. If you think about the old model, not only was it really expensive, this is, by the way, slow. where we did a, an iPhone app for our cloud and a, an iPad app because we know. People yeah, because you're just sitting there. Exactly right. Why and why not make it as easy as possible? Wherever you have the idea, when inspiration strikes, do it. Think about the number of people you used to have to get permission from to build a company. Right? You had to raise money to build factories, to get permits, to you had to like negotiate advertising contracts to get distribution. You had to you know beg. I mean, just the number of people you had to beg, borrow, and steal from was huge. You know, big part of the like Karl Marx critique of capitalism, right, was the ownership of the means of production. That those who control the physical plants that you need access to control what's possible to be done. Well, guess what? We now are entering the era of the rentership of the means of production. Because if you have a credit card, you can rent the means of production by the hour. And that's not just the cloud computing that you need, the resources you need to build the app. It's also design resources. It's also advertising resources, right? For $5 a day on Google AdWords, you can buy clicks to get people to your app to figure out what works. So you don't have to beg anybody for permission. It's all open access. It's a really important change. And it's not just in software. Yeah. These trends are increasingly becoming possible in hardware, in bioscience, in clean tech. I think we are on the cusp of a new industrial revolution where truly every person, if they want, at any time. From anywhere. From anywhere. Yeah. Uh, even, if you're not even if you're not wealthy, if you have the insight and the skill, you can uh, start a company. You can test your idea. You can run an experiment. Now, as a matter of public policy, we have to really think about how do we make sure that everybody, in fact, has those set of skills. But yeah. that's for a different day. Education re-engineering, re which we to can be. talk to Salman Khan about, right? Absolutely right. We are not teaching the right set of skills today. And we, if we're going to get serious about building a new economy that, that depends on creativity for, uh, for growth, 
we're going to have to really be empowering people to take those those productive risks. Um, so we have an idea. We probably have a team of two people, three people. I got a pretty good team here. Yeah. We have a cloud server. We're putting up code. We're probably using tools like uh, New Relic or Logly. Logly, by the way, lets you offshore your logs, right, <laughs> to another service, and you can analyze what's going on, how your so customers. Cool. Now, what should we build into logging in our app? What what should we be measuring, you know, for our customer interaction? What kinds of things do investors want to see, and what kinds of things do we want to learn about the customers who are going to use this yeah. iPhone app? We, this is a really, really tricky question because people, I'm all about analytics and measurement. I'm always trying to get startups to measure the right things. And some people take away from that, more measurement is better. And so they load up like 52 analytics packages into their app, and then they've got 10,000 graphs of everything. And they quickly run into what I call Eric's Law of Google Analytics, which is no matter how badly you're screwing up, at, at all times, there's at least one graph in Google Analytics that is up and to the right. So if you need to go to a board meeting to show how everything's great, you could always find something to be like, look, a graph, it's up to the right. Up, and we all know up and to the right is better than the alternative, therefore yeah. everything's fine. And it's basically, the plan there is, let's just ship it, see what happens. And the problem with that is that's not science. If your plan is to ship it and see what happens, you are guaranteed to succeed at seeing what happens. Something is definitely going to happen, and then you can call that thing success, and that is not science. What we want to do is, instead of doing astrology, we want to do science, which means make a specific prediction, a per customer, not a mass prediction, like we'll have a million customers, okay, vanity metrics, who cares? But of the 100 customers we do have, 50 of them will be addicted to our product and use it every day, okay? That's, if that's the key thing we need to be true, then that's a very simple, straightforward prediction. It's an empirical test. Let's just measure that one thing. And then we can figure out, okay, what are the analytics providers that help us make that customer report? But a lot of times, the things we want to measure are so simple and basic, yep. it's just, it's easier to just make the report yourself. Because now all, we're, all we really want to know is not how many, you know, all, all these like synthetic things, like how many hits do we get, how many like customer to customer interactions. I once competed against a company that kept reporting on the gross domestic product of all the user to user transactions, you know what I'm talking about probably. Yep. And it was like, I remember my CEO used to always turn to me and be like, so what's our GDP? I was like, no, no, that's a meaningless number. It's just a inflated thing. What does that even mean, GDP? It's a macro. And, they, and he'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. But what's our GDP? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, I, it's so frustrating. So listen, using those vanity metrics to make your competitors feel bad, time-honored technique, all for it, no problem. But internally, we don't want to drink our own Kool-Aid. What we want to really be testing is what are the per user, what I call the actionable metrics that really matter, the ones that help us figure out what's cause and effect. How can we cause our numbers to go up instead of just you know, hoping for the best. Now, at, at Rackspace, we, we study uh, customer satisfaction. We use yeah. this uh, net promoter maybe. net promoter score, which I love Apple net promoter uses. score. Yeah. T tell me why you love it. Oh, uh, and explain yeah. what it is. Sure, no, 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 no problem. No problem. There's actually, I wrote a whole blog post uh, uh, about net promoter score for the details. But the basic idea is, net promoter score is a very clever um, system that exploits a bug in human psychology for the best, which is that if you ask someone what they think of a product, like you ask, you ask customers like, will you buy my product, what, would you use my product tomorrow? You ask people questions about themselves, they're actually incapable of giving you an accurate answer. That's why focus groups do not work. You know, the old visionary refrain of, you know, can't ask customers what they want because they don't know is totally true. People yeah. do not know what they want. So net promoter score, you don't ask people what they want. You ask people, would you recommend our product to a friend or colleague? And what's fascinating about it is that does not predict the likelihood that they would refer your product to a friend or colleague. People don't know what they would do, so they actually have no idea if they would do it or not. What happens is when you're asked about somebody else, you project yourself onto them because you just assume everybody's just like you. And so actually, Net Promoter Score is a, is a proven methodology for assessing customer satisfaction. And there's a whole numerical thing about how you measure and you subtract the numbers, yeah. and you basically gives you a single score that tells you how uh, much customers like your product. And we use Net Promoter Score at Infu. The awesome thing about it is it's so stable. Yeah. It doesn't fluctuate like crazy with you know the day of the month or you know like a new feature. No, it, like it measures core satisfaction. And I remember, you you use these kind of metrics, you quickly become a conspiracy theorist. You know, it's like today our score is X, and then we make the product better tomorrow. We make the better you know, make the product better every single day for like months, and the score is the same. You start to be like. Did today's customers call up yesterday's customers and get on a conference call and like, hey guys, how many of you like the product? Okay, just because like, how is it so stable? How can it be the same? And the answer is that if the product works, it either, you know, either works or it doesn't work and it's going to be the same cohort after cohort. And the reason these metrics are so powerful is that 
after you know, a couple of months of making the product better every day, and the numbers aren't changing, you've got to start to say, wait a minute. In, in what world, in what universe, is the product actually better? Yeah. Right? I remember we used to fix tons of bugs, add all these great new features, improve our marketing, but the numbers are the same. Yeah. So if they're the same, you know what in science we would call an independent controlled trial, then we have to conclude that it's not better. All the work we're doing is, in fact, a waste of time. And the most of the teams that I meet with that are not using this kind of methodology today have to face the really depressing fact that most of the work that they, do, that they are doing right now doesn't matter to anybody. It's having no impact whatsoever. And that's, you know, the reason this is hard to adopt is that's really depressing. But if, that, if that's, well, not you. No, none of you are having this problem. But if you had a friend who had that problem, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, wouldn't they want to know as soon as possible so that you could do something about it? That's, yeah. that's what we're trying to get people to do. You, you have any uh, thoughts on this before we move on? Well, I was just thinking about the, the whole uh, metrics thing. And I, I assume that you know, metrics are important to an extent. And then there might be a place where too much metrics sort of ends up paralyzing oh, yeah. you. Because I mean, you know, there's yeah. this theory in accounting where you, know, you, can, you can measure too far and cost too much to do that measurement. And is, that, is that sometimes a trap that Absolutely. you see people fall into? It's your old analysis paralysis, yeah. where you, you get excited about the analytics and you forget that the analytics is just in service of building a great product. We have a heuristic in Lean Startup we call Build, Measure, Learn, which is a simple three-stage feedback loop. You know, in Lean Manufacturing, the core cycle time was how much time between when I get an order from a customer and when I ship them the product. In a startup, the comparable cycle time is what's the time that elapses between when I have an idea and I have validated if that idea is any good or not. So a startup turns ideas into products. That's called building. When customers interact with those products, we measure what happens and collect data. So that's measure. And then if we want, we can take that data and learn which impacts our next set of ideas. That's a very simple three-stage feedback loop, build, measure, learn. The heuristic is we want to see all of our infrastructure process, everything we do, should be designed to minimize total time through that loop. So if we don't measure anything, we can build faster. Just like if I want to get my car moving as fast as possible, I can close my eyes and floor the accelerator. But I'm not going to get anywhere that way. And similarly, if I want to just sit at the whiteboard and learn things you know, by moving boxes and diagrams all the time, like I learned in my MBA program, like, go ahead. But you don't actually learn anything because you're not building anything. It's a fact-free zone. And so if you think about how do you get through that loop as fast as possible, you start to say, wait a minute, measuring more stuff is actually counterproductive. Because if I have 10,000 sources of information, I can't learn anything. And you spend all your time trying to figure out how to track those things. I mean, sometimes a spreadsheet can be your friend because you just you know, throw those metrics on there Exactly Look at them right. in a quick graph and, and I mean. And here's the awesome thing about having a pathetically small number of customers. That's like a huge asset. It means you can get to know them really well. Right. Yeah. If you only have a couple dozen customers, you don't need fancy analytics. You could just keep track Call on them. note cards. Yeah. Call them up. Hey, did you use my product That's today right. or not? Airbnb went through a thousand days of their business wasn't working and then Paul Graham said, go and meet your customers and they took a road trip and drove around the country and so went and met customers. Right. Steve Blank calls it getting out of the building, actually seeing your customers firsthand. In Toyota Production System, they have a phrase called Genchi Gambutsu in, J in Japanese. It means literally go and see for yourself. So if you find yourself in a position where your hypothesis isn't working, the numbers can never tell you why. They can just tell you, you suck, and then you're depressed. Yeah. But going and seeing for yourself, you can actually start to figure out what's not working. And these two things are essential to do together. If all you ever do is spend time with customers spinning stories, you can convince yourself that everything's fine. I mean, every focus group I ever did in my life told me my product was great, no matter how bad it was. You know, you just, somehow you always see the good. So the quantitative stuff helps you realize, no, I have a problem. But then it gives you the questions to really ask, like, okay, but my problem is now not my product sucks in general. It's very specific. People won't click this freaking download button. Well, why is that? Now I have a very targeted question that when I go meet customers in person, like that great Airbnb story, then I understand what I want to ask, and I'm primed to actually learn something. Yeah. I, I'm getting a lot of questions about team building. You yeah. Know? Okay, we're, we're two people building this company. Um, how do we decide to hire a, a fourth person if it's three people or a fifth person? And how do we grow this thing? And wh when should we grow it? It's, it's really challenging. Most entrepreneurs believe that products just grow if they're good. And I think that is really misleading. Because although every product has a certain amount of word of mouth growth, word of mouth is a very slow process. The kind of growth we want as entrepreneurs, the hockey stick shaped growth, happens in very specific, very structured ways. And if you don't understand what those ways are, it's very hard to engineer that growth intentionally. So here's the law of sustainable growth. It is that 
new customers come from the actions of past customers. That's it. So a Super Bowl ad doesn't count. A, you know, doing a bunch of blitz PR one time, you know, that's not sustainable. What is sustainable is you take the revenue from past customers and reinvest in advertising, right? That's sustainable. Or you have a viral business where the past customers force new customers to check out your product, you know, whether they want to or not, right? A virus is not optional. You can't be like, Ebola epidemic, I I'm going to opt out. Like, no, that's talk not how it works. Talk to Mark Zuckerberg about Open Graph. I have some videos running probably later tonight on that. Yeah. That's the new virality in, in Silicon Valley, and every company has to have a Facebook strategy, even if it's, we're not going to do it. <laughs> right, right. You definitely have to think about it. Yep. Or maybe the past customers are your new customers because you haven't locked into some kind of addictive or subscription-based business. So those are kind of what I call the three engines of growth, paid, viral, and sticky. You can obviously learn more in the book. Each of those is a very specific quantitative framework that helps you figure out what's the one number that will drive growth for me. So if I'm paying for customer acquisition, well, then the thing that will determine how fast the engine turns is simply my marginal profit per customer. Like, how much more does it, do I make per customer than it costs me to acquire? And it doesn't matter if it's $1.10 in profit for a dollar acquisition or $110,000 for $100,000. Like, that's still a 10% marginal profit, and so I'm going to grow at that rate. Yeah. And similarly with a viral business, all that matters is viral coefficient. You know, 0.8, you're shrinking. 1.1, you're in hypergrowth. Explain what viral coefficient is because that's a really powerful idea uh, that Silicon Valley companies use. Yeah. Especially, especially when we're doing something like, like a, a bragging iPhone app. It's right? so important. If, that, if that's our plan. So for those who don't know, viral coefficient means uh, how many people on average does each new customer bring with them when they use your product? So if it was exactly one for one, viral coefficient of exactly 1.0, then each customer would come in, use your product, invite one friend, and they would leave, and the new friend would replace them, and on and on and on. So 1.0 would be an exact steady state product if you had no, no retention. And if the number was greater than 1.0, you would have a viral epidemic on your hand because each person brings more and more and more people with them, and it goes crazy. And if it's less than 1.0, fundamentally your business will shrink. So a lot of businesses don't measure that, which is a huge mistake. But the next mistake people make is you measure that number, and then you want to just think about it in absolute terms. Like if you have a viral coefficient of 0.5, that seems pretty good. It's like, hey, for every customer I get, you know, for every two customers I get, I get another customer for free. That's pretty good. But if your goal is to use the viral engine of growth, 0.5 is terrible. You got to get to 1.0. It's like 1.0 or bust. On the other hand, if you're using a different engine of growth, if you're fundamentally focused on advertising to acquire customers, 0.5 is pretty good. Because right, that's just free customer acquisition you didn't have to pay for. It's, like an, it's just a bonus. So these engines of growth allow you to figure out, where do I really need to focus? My experience is companies have to focus on one of the three to the exclusion of the other two. You know, if you look at a world of Warcraft, which is a classic engagement business, it's a product so addictive people cannot cancel their subscription because it would kill their character and can't do it. Okay, great business to be in. You know, they, they are really focused, they're really world class at uh, you know, making their product more addictive. Paid acquisition, TV ads, like they do do some TV ads, but they're not that good at it. It's just not their specialty. Viral, viral loops and stuff, they're not that great at it. Usability, man, installing World of Warcraft takes like four hours. It's a horrible, like 92 step process. It's terrible. Doesn't matter because the thing is addictive. It doesn't, nothing else matters. Whereas if you look at a Facebook, if Facebook had the same ease of install of World of Warcraft, it'd be dead in two seconds because they need that viral loop to be going. That means making it as easy as possible for people to get in there. So that's all a really long way of saying that's where growth comes from. So how do we know when it's time to scale the business? We want to scale the business in line with those engines of growth. As we make progress at making the engine turn faster, then we want to bring on more resources to take advantage of that. And that includes raising money as well as hiring people. Yeah. People often want to raise money and then spend that money on growth, like by buying ads or doing a Super Bowl ad or some kind of stunt. And that's a really bad trade because you're trading equity, which is forever for a one-time shot of growth, which is just for now. So you're buying growth with equity, which is always a mistake. Instead, you want to use venture investment and other resources to allow the engine to turn as fast as possible. So if you're Facebook and you're, you're getting a viral coefficient, but you can't afford to get enough servers to allow the thing to grow as fast as it wants, great use of venture capital. If you're making money per customer, but then you have to take that profit and instead of in reinvesting it in advertising, you have to invest it in covering your fixed costs. Well, now you're retarding the growth that you really want. Another great use for venture capital. So that, that's the general framework is you've got an engine of growth that's moving, that's starting to move in that right direction. You're getting the progress towards product market fit. That's the time to start investing in growth. Interesting. 
So when, in our little company, when should we uh, start thinking thinking about going and visiting Paul Graham or, or Ron Conway or uh, Jeff Clavier, when some of these angel investors, you know, or put, <laughs> when should we be putting our uh, company up on angel list, right, and hoping that somebody will call us? Yeah, you know, fundraising strategy has to be uh, an output of business strategy, not the other way around. So we really have to understand what is our plan for the long-term, you know, growth of the company. The challenge is that different people are able to raise money at good terms at different times in their life. Yeah. If you look the part, you kind of have the flavor of a, you know, you're like a Harvard dropout, CS major, super smart, you know, a little bit socially awkward. If you kind of have the look of a great entrepreneur, I mean, you can walk like into, John. you know. I don't look like that. <laughs> right, you, know? you look the part, you uh -huh. can raise money at great terms anytime. Yeah. You know, if you're a serial entrepreneur, if you've had success in the past, if you're coming out of one of the great feeder companies like a Facebook or a Zynga, you know, you, then you're in a different position than someone who doesn't look the part. And I think that's unfortunate. But traction talks. So, you know, the reason why if you look like Mark Zuckerberg, you can raise money at great terms is because when Mark Zuckerberg came to Silicon Valley, uh, he had traction that was unbelievable that allowed him to raise money at crazy, at crazy rates. So I generally believe... He didn't have that many customers back then. Exactly. His vanity metrics were pathetically low, but the per customer numbers were unbelievable. And if you think about this in terms of two fundamental hypotheses of a business, one we call the value hypothesis, how do you know customers find it valuable? And two, the growth hypothesis, how do you know that once you get customers who find it valuable, you'll be able to get more of them? Facebook was off the charts. Value hypothesis, more than 50% of customers, even in those early days, used it every single day. Okay, so they find it valuable. And growth hypothesis, when they would launch on a new campus, I think it took them on average about two weeks to get to 80% customer wow. penetration on the whole campus. Okay, so they didn't have very many customers, but it was pretty clear this is a business with serious viability. So if you have that traction, I, so whenever possible, raise money with traction rather than with looks or a good story. It always, you'll always be able to get better terms. So I would say, pound your chest in the press, go talk to VCs, do the whole thing when you can show that there's real viability here. But you may have noticed we're going through kind of a flourishing. Uh, summer of entrepreneurship right now. Yeah. I always say winter is coming, so be ready. But during summer, it, it's be, fall right now, actually. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> people are saying it's getting tougher to raise money. It's, yeah, you know, when, when the tough, money is flowing, when there are yeah. programs that can get you automatic hype and, and get you into the system, like, it's hard for me to say don't take advantage of those resources because, you know, you may as well sock the resources away during summer and have them available for like winter. Zero percent financing for a, a car. Take yeah. advantage of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so it's not a clear cut answer. I just, if you go into that system, make sure you go in with eyes open because you will be under tremendous pressure to show vanity metrics and to show early success. You know, from from a very early phase, and that that can that kind of pressure can lead you to act in very undisciplined, very unfortunate ways. So, if you have the strength to resist that temptation, yeah. well, those programs are great. If not, you know, buyer beware. And whatever you're doing, ask yourself for every program that I'm involved with, every, you know, we're doing all these mixers and incubators and all these programs, how do I know that the work I'm doing today is really creating value versus just being part of a hype machine? And if you feel like, you know, there's a little too much hype here, I just say, look, you're going to be disappointed. When winter comes, you're going to regret the time you spent doing that. I, I do. So, you know, go I, make something happen. I almost started a business in the last six months and I turned it down because it was all hype and it wasn't based on building a, a real business. I didn't have a real business to show these kinds of metrics. You know, I've started a you know, few businesses over the years and then, I mean, I, I think you're right on. I mean, a lot of the things that, that you're talking about resonate so much with us. I mean, Rackspace has had a lot of success with little startups within the big organization, testing uh, a lot of your, uh, you know, the things you've talked about today. Thank you. Um, and so I, I, I totally buy into this. And even before that, you know, the startup that we had was a little internet service provider. It felt Felt like we were, you know, a uh, very scrappy young startup trying to get things going, but we just needed one customer, you know, to get uh, a little word of mouth going. I think we, at the time, you know, the internet was kind of a new thing to people, and you had to, uh, you know, get people to start doing the word of mouth. You had to do a little advertising, a little combination of all these things. Luckily, the internet was addicting, and luckily yeah. it starts to, you know, uh, feed on itself. People want email addresses so they can talk to other people, uh -huh. and it was uh, uh, certainly a lot of things you say. I mean, so your book is, is certainly something that... Uh, I think a ton of startups are going to get a lot of value out of it. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Rob, Robin, or somebody uh, on the web says, uh, for each of you personally, what example, what person or company was the kind of the one that it inspired you to kick off your own idea? Um, and uh, yeah, 
Uh, so who, who inspired you to start to be an entrepreneur? Because that, that yeah, this is, this is kind of embarrassing because the truth is I became an entrepreneur during the last dot-com bubble. Uh, so in 1999, it just seemed like everybody was becoming an entrepreneur. And what I understood that to mean was you kind of walk into some kind of venture capital office and get a check for $10 million. Step two, question mark. Step three, you then on a cover of magazines making a lot of money. And I was like, that seems like a pretty good deal. It just didn't seem that was that hard. And so I actually, I regret that I got into entrepreneurship for the money and the fame and the excitement of it. I didn't really have any specific model in mind. And you can imagine the kind of results I got with that, uh, with that in mind. So yeah, it was, it was pretty much a, a, a hot mess. And I wish I could go back and say, because just so you know, the first business I built as a startup uh, was in my college dorm at Yale. We had the idea, see if this sounds good to you. Our idea was um, college students should create online profiles for the purpose of sharing. Mm -hmm. Right? Seems pretty good. But of course, we thought that they should share them with employers to help them get a job. So it's like, oh, so close, right? So, you know, uh, just a few degrees off from what would turn out later to be proven to be a gigantic business. And if we were so, you know, focused on the money that if you went back in time and said to us, listen, there's going to be this thing called Facebook and you have a chance to be it and here's how it works and told us about Poke and we've been like, Poke? Yeah. <laughs> Shut the heck up. You know, what are you talking about? Like, Poke? We're trying to build a real business here, you know, serious money-making enterprise, not some dumb Poke thing because we had no vision. And I think, you know, People think that being scientific is somehow opposed to having a vision, and that couldn't be more wrong. You can't do science without vision. And so uh, you have to have something worth testing in order for any of this to make any kind of sense, and we really didn't. So we were pretty much doomed from day one. Too bad. So in our hypothetical business, you know, we have this app. It's shipping. We got a million users. We probably have two employees now. We're like Instagram, something like you that. You keep forgetting me. I think you're bad at math. We're a three-person startup, Robert. <laughs> I'm, I'm like that with Two Rocky employees. Too. <laughs> My producer, I always leave him out of the equation. <laughs> Only question that matters is who has the equity. Yeah, I need some stock here, so make sure we're, uh, we're in on it. You could be like that third, uh, third guy who started Apple. Apple guy. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to be that. <laughs> so how do, we find st how do we find more engineers in S San Francisco? The, I, I hear it's really tough to find talent. Maybe even it's tough to find them in Moscow. Yeah, I hear that, right? So, Sign uh, of the apocalypse, yeah. How do we do this? How do, how, do we, how do we get to the next stage in our business? You have to be able to convince the people you want to hire that they're going to have a chance, a unique chance to change the world with you that they won't be able to get anywhere else. And that's actually really hard to do. Most startups, I mean, if you drive down the 101 here, you'll see 500 employment billboards. They're all the same. It's all like grandiose, you know, you're gonna, we're, it's gonna be great here, we have the best perks, or like, it's a great company, you're gonna, it's like, it's all very generic, and it's hard to really, it's the same lesson for how you market your product, is how do you connect with the thing that you really passionately care about, something that would actually turn off all the wrong candidates, but for the right candidate would be amazing. The first Silicon Valley startup I joined was this very hot virtual worlds company that was in stealth mode. And so, y when you would go to interview there, they, no one would tell you what the product was. It was a secret. And it was in this nondescript warehouse off the 101 in Mar Marsh Road, which is, I guess, going to be redeveloped now. And you walk in this warehouse, and you, you open the door, and there was this huge banner on the wall, and it said something like, um, we are building something that your friends will lust after and beg to beta test. It's not B2B e-commerce. We can't tell you what it is but we can tell you who's on the team, and in startups, it's all about the team. Okay, picture this giant banner. For a lot of people who are looking for like, a reasonable job, this is like run for the hills. It's like, first of all, B2B e-commerce was the hot thing at that time, so it's like, we're not gonna make any money, and like, your friends are gonna beg you to beta test. Like, there's only a certain kind of person that's excited about that, and most important, this thing telegraphed, we are building a company that's not about the product, it's not about, it's about fundamentally working with the smartest, best people you'll ever find. And I remember seeing that banner and being like, I don't even know what this company does. This could be the CIA for all I know, but sign me up. This is the kind of place I want to work. When so you've got to find something differentiated like when that. When we started the, uh, the ISP years ago, we had people that begged us to work there, and they said they'd do it for free. They'd come after work. In fact, I even worked after my day job. I'd come and do free work for a while because it was such an exciting uh, time you know, in, in the Internet space. But I think that's the same thing you want to do now is figure out something that uh, you can create a story or a vision around where people would, would want to do it for free almost. I mean, they want to get involved with it because it's that cool. 
Any uh, last thoughts? Because we only have, I think, two minutes left. Uh, how should we wrap up this co company and uh, get it to the next level? Well, we've got to figure out who we're going to sell it to right now. So uh, we'll take some bids from the audience. Anyone want to buy our <laughs> incredible? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. See, we already got two or three bidders. We're going to make, make a lot of money. <laughs> They're on test flight right now waiting <laughs> for the app. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I will say this. Um, if you want to make money, entrepreneurship is really not a good choice. Just statistically speaking, it's not actually the best way. Go work at Goldman Sachs, for God's sake. I mean, guaranteed riches await. Um, but entrepreneurship is a career that allows you to simultaneously create value and make a lasting impact. Build something that will live beyond you. Uh, and also make customers' lives better it's all at the too. same time. And yeah, and it's pretty freaking fun. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, maybe my closing comment is, Entrepreneurship is too valuable a resource for us to waste on, you know, on faith-based initiatives. It deserves the rigor uh, and, uh, and discipline of science. Alexander asks, how important, is it, how important is it to be first in your space? Well, we have Google as an example. Of Not important at all. I think Google was the 17th search engine. Yeah, yeah and Facebook was the 95th social network. And uh, Henry Ford, I actually learned this in the research for my book, was the 500th automobile company. So 499 people, think about this. In the, talk about being in the right place at the right time. You are an auto, you know, a, a mechanical engineer who understands how to build an internal combustion engine at the dawn of the biggest industrial enterprise opportunity in history. And for the first 499 people to try didn't make any money at all. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Thank you have to be so right. Much. Thanks for coming out. Hey, thanks for having me. Really thanks appreciate it. Thanks for being it. our first speaker. <laughs> in our hey, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Welcome to the neighborhood. Thanks. Thank you.